Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Wojciech Ledvina and I work in the company Eastport as an application specialist. And uh, I would like to welcome you at our today's webinar that will focus on the Halo Tech technology and nanobread assays. And to introduce our today's speaker, uh, today's speaker is Dr. Eric Bonke from Promega Germany. And uh, he's the he works as the field support and and application specialist uh, in the applications regarding luminescent reporter essays and protein protein interactions and he's the best man to give you more information about our today's topic so eric you can please start sharing your screen and start the presentation uh -huh. okay great so I um, will switch off my camera during the talk. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for joining this webinar. Thanks for your interest uh, in today's uh, topic. Um, as we've heard already today, we're gonna focus on two, um, well, set, let's say key Promega technologies. Both of them are fusion tech based technologies that can be used for cellular protein analysis. One of them is called HaloTag. This is actually quite a universal fusion tag that you can use for lots of applications, as you will see. And the second technology is called NanoBrad. And NanoBrad can be in particular used for studying protein-protein interactions in living cells. And here in the NanoBrad PPI system, HaloTag is a key component, in fact. Um, but then I also would like to briefly talk about the use of nanobread for studying protein ligand interaction, meaning the interaction of a small molecule or a peptide with a given protein of interest in living cells. Okay, so um, let's start by addressing uh, the question what HaloTag actually is. It is um, a 34 kilodalton protein, a genetically evolved prokaryotic dehalogenase from the bacterium Rhodococcus rhodochros. And this enzyme actually catalyzes the hydrolytic cleavage of carbon halogen bonds. And during this catalytic cycle, a covalent intermediate is formed, whereas this intermediate is formed at this aspartate residue 106 and the enzymatic activity now is eventually restored by hydrolytic cleavage of this covalent bond whereas for this um, the histidine residue 272 is indispensable and in fact this amino acid is one of the amino acids that was substituted by uh, during the developmental process of HaloTag. So this histidine residue was substituted by phenylalanine, thereby preventing the reversal of this covalent bond. So this in fact now means that we can rapidly and easily irreversibly label HaloTag proteins with so-called HaloTag ligands. And we can do this very specifically because there is no endogenous equivalent in eukaryotes. Such a halo tag ligand is composed of a chloroalkane linker sequence, as you can see it here. This is the part of the ligand that is irreversib irreversibly bound by halo tag, and then attached to this a functional group. And this functional group can be of diverse identity. This could be a fluorophore. We offer quite a large selection of fluorescent halo tag ligands, various colors, different physiochemical properties, meaning cell permeable and impermeable ligands. But this functional group could also be a solid support, such as a sepharose bead or a magnetic bead, namely the halo link resin or the magna halo tag beads. And furthermore, it can be a small molecule. And today I would like to show you at the end of the presentation, a nice example where we actually fused a small molecule that binds to the von Hippel-Lindau E3 ligase to this chloroalkane linker and thereby have a nice tool to promote targeted degradation of halotech fusion proteins. 
And last but not least, we um, have the so-called Halo tag ligand building blocks. Here, this functional group is um, represented by a reactive group, such um, as a succimidule ester, an amine, iodacetamide, or a thiol. Um, and this gives you plenty of flexibility to create your own halo tag ligand. So every halo tag based experiment basically starts off with labeling the protein of interest with the halo tag protein. And for this, you can mainly pursue two major strategies. One is to use a conventional expression plasmid in which you clone the open reading frame of your gene of interest. And transfecting this plasmid into cells will allow for an ectopic transient expression of your recombinant halotech fusion protein. For this purpose, we do offer quite a large selection of various halotech entry vectors. And with regard to this approach, I also would like to point out the so-called Find My Gene database which is a large repository of more than 9,000 different human open reading frames that were already cloned into Halotag fusion vectors. The second option you have is to tag your gene of interest with the Halotag encoding sequence. And you can do this with any, well, genomic engineering technology, for example, using CRISPR-Cas9. Um, if you follow this strategy, you will end up with your recombinant protein being expressed under the control of the native promoter, meaning you will end up with native expression levels. And the benefit, of course, is that this strategy also maintains the transcriptional regulation of your gene. So once you've tagged your um, protein of interest with Halotag and you expressed it in cells, you can now very easily append diverse chemical functionalities to that protein by simple addition of one of the many Halotag ligands that we do provide, and therefore make this protein accessible to the various downstream applications that Halotag enables you. If we have a look at what these applications are, um, first of all, it's fluorescent imaging. I mentioned already we have quite a large selection of fluorescent halotag ligands. So it's very easy if you use these ligands to localize um, a halotag fusion protein within the cell. Halotag does support cellular imaging with live and fixed cells, but also whole animal imaging. And some of our ligands are also supporting um, super resolution microscopy. The second major application of Halotag is in fact the purification of proteins or the pull down of proteins or whole protein complexes in order to identify binding partners of certain proteins. And in a similar fashion, we actually um, developed um, a method called target identification in which you can identify binding partners of certain small molecules. This is, um, well, a technology that is, or a method that is mainly used in drug discovery, of course. And in principle, we run a pull-down experiment using a small molecule, and we then identify the pulled down proteins by uh, mass spectrometry. Another application of Halotag, I mentioned this already at the beginning, Halotag is a key component of the so-called nanobread protein-protein interaction uh, system, system, which we will focus on today in more detail later on. This technology um, can be used to study the interaction of two proteins in a live cell context. It's a reversible technology, meaning you can really look at the dynamics of such an interaction, look at the association of these proteins as well as their dissociation. And besides studying protein-protein interaction, Halotag is also useful to study the interaction of proteins with DNA, this is called halo chip. Um, it's pretty much similar to a conventional 
chromatin immunoprecipitation approach. The major difference here is um, that it's a completely antibody-free workflow, which makes it a rapid workflow, so you can accomplish it in less than 48 hours. However, today, due to the um, uh, limitation in time, we will not touch on this application of HaloTech, but maybe somewhere uh, at a different time. And the last application that I would like to talk about today um, is targeted protein degradation. I mentioned already that we uh, developed a halo tag ligand um, that utilizes a small molecule which recruits this uh, von Hippel-Lindau E3 ligase. And with this ligand, the so-called halo protec 3 you can now distinctively target halo tag fusion proteins for proteasomal degradation. So you can specifically knock down these proteins, and that's a helpful tool if you want to run phenotypic studies to elucidate gene function. Okay, so uh, let's start with uh, the fluorescent imaging application. As I said, we have quite a large selection of established fluorescent halo tag ligands, various colors, different physiochemical properties, meaning permeable and impermeable ligands, and these ligands can actually be grouped according to the protocol that is employed for labeling. So the ligands that you can see here are the so-called rapid labeling ligands because they follow the rapid labeling protocol. These two ligands are the no-wash labeling ligands. Uh, this no-wash labeling protocol is a protocol with less hands-on time as it does not require any washing steps. And then finally, we have the rapid no-wash labeling ligands. Um, here, these ligands are all based on Janela fluor dyes. Um, in fact, this slide is not up to date anymore. So we now we do have more than these two. Uh, I think, meanwhile, we have around um, six different uh, Janela fluor dyes based halo tag ligands. And these ligands are, in fact, those that furthermore do support super-resolution microscopy. The protocol that these um, ligands are used with is kind of a mixture between the rapid labeling and the no-wash labeling, which is why they are called the rapid no-wash labeling ligands. So all of these ligands are characterized by showing no cytotoxicity, and they all exhibit minimal background fluorescence, which is important. And as I mentioned already, um, halotech fluorescent imaging can be applied for both live cells as well as fixed cells. And this is possible due to this irreversible nature of the halotech labeling, because this persists the fixation process of the cells. The fact that we have different colors and different uh, properties, uh, permeable and impermeable ligands, gives us spatial temporal control of the labeling. So it enables us to run pulse chase experiments to look at things such as protein turnover or protein trafficking within the cell. And then finally, the fluorescent halo tag imaging um, application can be combined with other protein labeling techniques such as immunocytochemistry or autofluorescent proteins. Next, I would like to have a brief look at the workflow um, that you would follow in order to fluorescently label a halotech protein within the cell in order to run an imaging experiment. The first step, of course, is that you express your protein of interest as a halo tag fusion. And then the actual first step of the labeling process is the addition of one of the fluorescent halo tag ligands, followed by incubation for the rapid labeling ligands. This is a 15 to 60 minute incubation step. For the no wash labeling ligands, this is an overnight incubation step. You can now proceed or if you would like to run a pulse chase experiment, then this is the time where you would add your second fluorescent halo tag ligand followed by the respective incubation time. And the rest of the protocol basically depends on whether you would like to run an endpoint assay with fixed cells 
or if you would like to run a live cell imaging experiment. For an endpoint assay, you would simply fix your cells. Here we recommend 4% pyroform aldehyde. You can then optionally permeabilize the cells with a detergent such as Triton. Uh, you wash with PBS and you can immediately proceed with your immunocytochemistry labeling protocol or directly image if you don't want to do any antibody-based labeling. For a live cell assay, um, if you use one of the no-wash labeling ligands, you simply have to replace medium after this overnight incubation and you proceed with the imaging of your cells. If you used one of the rapid labeling ligands, you have to apply several wash steps for both permeable and impermeable ligands, these, um, this encompasses two washing steps and the permeable ligands that reach the inner uh, of the cell, they have to, uh, there you have to perform uh, an additional washout step of 30 minutes. This is simply required to get rid of all the unreacted halotec ligand from within the cell. You then replace medium and you image. So once you've fluorescently labeled your halotech fusion protein within the cell, you can readily localize, very easily localize that protein within the cell that is kind of illustrated by these images here. Um, and these images also nicely emphasize that halotech is really capable of going anywhere within the cell. So if we fuse halotag to a nuclear localization sequence, we get a staining of the nucleus. If we add a mitochondrial target sequence to halotag, we get a staining of mitochondria. P65 halotag under non-stimulated conditions is restricted to the cytosol, and we see this nice exclusion of the nucleus. And if we fuse halotech to a membrane protein, we get a nice staining of the cellular membrane. Halotech fluorescent imaging is compatible with other labeling techniques, as I mentioned. Here you can see the multiplexing with autofluorescent proteins, such as uh, GFP, et cetera. And the benefit of halotech is here really that you have this large selections of large selection of different colors. So it's very easily to match uh, the spectral properties of your autofluorescent protein that you might be using already. It can also be combined with uh, immunocytochemistry. In this example shown here, we expressed a P65 halotech fusion and we labeled the live cells using the halotech TMR ligand. We then, <clears throat> excuse me, fix the cells, um, permeabilize the cells with a triton and added an anti-halotech polyclonal antibody that we then detected using a secondary antibody conjugated to Alexa Fluor 488. The merge of these two images here on the right hand side nicely illustrates how specific the labeling with these halo tag ligands actually is because we get a nice yellow, thorough yellow uh, staining basically. And here's just another example again with this P65 halo tag fusion that was uh, stained with the halo tag TMR ligand. And upon fixation of the cells, we now stained the cytoskeleton, uh, a cytoskeleton with an anti -BT, uh, beta 3 tubulin antibody. Besides analysis of fixed cells, halo tag can be also applied for live cell imaging. and this allows you to look at dynamic processes within cells. And one of these is, for example, the translocation of proteins. In this example, we looked at the translocation of the transcription factor uh, NF-kappa-B from the cytosol to the nucleus when these cells were stimulated with, for example, TNF-alpha. So here you can see an example of um, a staining that was performed with um, either the uh, TMR direct halotech ligand or the R110 direct ligand. 
um, we stained P65 Halo Tech Fusions. And again, as we saw already, this under non stimulated conditions gives a nice staining of the cytosol, whereas the uh, nucleus is completely excluded from that staining. If we now add TNF alpha to those cells and we perform this live cell imaging, we can actually see a time dependent increase in the nuclear staining starting at around 10 minutes, reaching a maximum at around 25 minutes. And if we continue imaging, we are actually able to see a gradual decline of this uh, nucleus, um, nuclear staining simply due to the relocalization of P65 to the cytosol. The fact that we have the different colors gives us um, kind of a temporal control over labeling. So we can run also pulse chase analysis to look at things such as protein turnover, which is illustrated in this example here. Um, so for looking at protein turnover uh, by pulse chase analysis, you would first express your halo tag fusion protein. You would add a first fluorescent halo tag ligand with, in this case, a red fluorophore. You incubate to allow for de novo protein biosynthesis, and you now label this novel protein pool or freshly synthesized protein pool with a second halotech ligand, in this case with a green fluorophore. This is what we did in this experiment here with uh, U2OS cells that transiently expressed the halotech protein. And we applied the no-wash labeling protocol to label distinct um, pools of these halotech proteins. So first, we labeled for 20 hours with the red Halotech Team R direct ligand. And then we labeled another 20 hours with the green Halotech R110 direct ligand. At 40 hours, we then took an image, which you can see down below, and you can nicely see the two different uh, Halotech pools in red. Those Halotech proteins that were produced or, or were already present up to 20 hours. And in green, those Halotech proteins that were synthesi synthesized between uh, 20 and 40 hours. Now that we do not only have different colors, but also ligands of different physiochemical properties, meaning permeable and impermeable ligand. We can run pulse chase analysis also to look at things such as receptor trafficking. In this case, you would express your halotech receptor fusion and then add, first of all, a cell impermeable ligand, in this case with a green fluorophore. This impermeable ligand um, will only st stain the membrane-bound fraction of your halotech receptor fusion. And you then add a cell permeable ligand, in this case with a red fluorophore. And of course, as the membrane bound fraction is already saturated with the green ligand, you will only stain the intracellular pool with this, this cell permeable ligand. In this example here, we express the beta-1 integrin halotech fusion, and we first labeled 15 minutes with the green Halotech Alexa Flu 488 impermeable ligand, followed by 15 minute incubation with the permeable Halotech TMR ligand. We then washed and took an image, which you can see here, where you can immediately recognize these two different Halotech pools. In green, the pool that is restricted to the, the cellular membrane, and then the intracellular pool. If we incubate another 12 hours and then take another image, we can see the trafficking of each of those two pools. The green extracellular pool is being internalized, as we can see from the formation of these vesicles, and the red intracellular pool is going to be translocated to the cellular membrane.
This brings me to the second application of the HaloTech technology, which is a purification and pull down of HaloTech fusion proteins. And in such an experiment, as I mentioned already, we make use of a solid support that is coated with this chloroalkane linker sequence. And this solid support can be a sephirose bead, we call that the halo link resin, or it can be a magnetic bead, which we call the magna halo tag beads. So to this purification matrix, you will now add your sample, meaning your cell lysate or your cell culture supernatant that contains the halo tag fusion protein. And what is now going to happen is that this protein is immobilized on the purification matrix irreversibly by binding of halotag to this chloroalkane linker. The fact that this interaction is irreversible now gives us the opportunity to wash very stringently so we can nicely um, remove any unspecifically bound proteins and thereby yield really um, high purity of the protein in the end that we would like to purify and also a higher yield as when compared to non-irreversible purification um, technologies. The elution is performed by proteolytic cleavage using a so-called TEF protease. So between the halotech protein and the protein of interest in the linker region right here, there is a TEF cleavage site included. And the smart thing now is that we don't simply use a TAF protease, but we use a TAF protease that is also tagged with the halo tag protein. We do this because this leads to the fact that this TAF protease is also immobilized on the purification matrix. So in the end, you don't have to remove it from the LU8, but your LU8 simply contains your TAC-free purified protein of interest. In this example, we uh, purified P65 either by using Halo tag, and we compared this to, to other purification tags, his tag and flag tag. And as you can nicely see, Halo tag really outperforms these other two tags, which can be um, um, seen not only by protein yield, but also by purity. And this can be nicely explained by the fact that the, the halo link resin that was used in this experiment is really selective for halo tag proteins, so no unspecific binding is actually observed. And the fact that halo tag is not or no analogous proteins to halo tag are found in mammalian cells. And last but not least, of course, due to the fact that we have this irreversible coupling to the purification matrix and the fact that we can therefore very stringently perform washes. In a similar fashion, you can now use these purification matrices, matrices uh, to, to um, isolate whole protein complexes to perform pull-down experiments, co-IP experiments. In fact, the principle is exactly the same. In this case, you would add your sample that contains your halotech fusion protein that is still bound to the interacting proteins. You can then perform the elution with the halotech protease. So you would end up with your native protein complex in the eluate. Or optionally, you can also run a denaturing elution using either SDS or urea. Uh, in this case, only the interacting proteins of your protein of interest will be found in the LU8, while the halotag fusion protein is still bound on the purification matrix. Again, here is an example um, where we followed this procedure again for P65 halotag. So we ran a pull down experiment of P65 halotag. Um, halotag alone was used as a control. This is a cell lysate of HeLa cells. And in fact, we were able, to, if we analyzed this LU8, we were able to identify many of the well-known 
direct but also indirect interaction partners of uh, P65 using mass spectrometry. As I mentioned at the beginning, we also developed this chemoproteomics approach um, called target identification. And this approach allows you now to identify targets of a small molecule. Target identification is actually part of various drug discovery strategies, be it a phenotypic uh, based strategy where you have a phenotype observed and you would like to know what interaction is this phenotype based on, or whether it is a targeted based uh, drug discovery strategy where you would like to identify secondary or off targets of that small molecule. So in the end, it addresses the question of how specific a given drug is. All these questions can be nicely addressed using uh, this target identification method um, of which HaloTag is a key component. And in fact, this method is based on this photoreactive cleavable chloroalkane. Um, as you can see in blue here is the chloroalkane linker sequence that is bound by HaloTag. It's denoted as capture moiety. And this is intercepted by a cleavable moiety, a photoreactive group. And all this is attached to the small molecule of interest. The way that this method works is that, of course, first you have to attach this uh, photoreactive cleavable chloroalkane to your small molecule of interest. And, of course, you have to now verify that this modified compound is still cell, cell permeable. It still binds to the halotag or it binds to the halotag protein and it still produces the desired phenotype, which you can, well, investigate using a particular cell-based assay, for example. Once you've verified all this, you simply add your modified compound to the cells. You incubate to allow for target engagement. And then you UV irradiate your cells to photo crosslink the interaction of your compound with whatever targets this compound is bound to. You then lyse the cells, and the cell lysate is now added to so called halo tag beads. These are magnetic beads that were coated with the halo tag protein, and to these beads, the cross linked drug target complexes are now irreversibly bound. Again, this um, attachment is irreversible, which gives you the ability to stringently wash and thereby remove all unspecifically bound proteins. And this time, we don't perform the illusion with a protease. This time, this is a chemically catalyzed illusion using a palladium catalyst, so that in the LU8, you will find your pulled down um, drug target cross-linked drug target uh, complexes that you can in the last step now analyze using mass spectrometry. This brings me um, to the application um, to study protein-protein interactions, also known as nanobread protein-protein interaction. So this is in fact um, a combination of two of the major technologies that we are going to talk about today, meaning nanobread and halotag. And as I pointed out already, it's a nice tool to actually investigate interactions of proteins in a cellular context, a life cell context. It's Actually, not a method to identify de novo protein protein interaction pairs, but it's more or less intended to be used to characterize um, an interaction that you identified and verified with other conventional methods, such as uh, co IP, for example, or uh, mass spectrometry, and so on. Oh, Eric, sorry yes. to interrupt you, but we have a question in the chat. 
Okay. Does the does the halo tag require placing at C or N terminus of the protein, or can it be placed in between two components of fusion protein? Um, no, it has been has to be put some at one of the termini, so N or C terminally. It's uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's a 34 kilo dalton protein. Um, so I don't think that you could place it somewhere within the protein without uh, severely affecting the, the, the structure or properties of that particular protein. Um, okay, so nanobread, um, this is actually an abbreviation for nanolock bioluminescence resonance energy transfer. I'm pretty sure that every one of you has heard about FRET. Um, in FRET, we use two fluorophores, and BRET is pretty much similar to FRET with the um, distinction that in BRET, we don't use two fluorophores, but we use a luciferase as the light source, which is why we call that the donor, and we use a fluorophore as the acceptor molecule. So if these two components, donor and acceptor, achieve a certain spatial proximity of less than 10 nanometers in distance, so they have to be really close, then part of the luciferase's emission energy can be transferred non-radiantly onto that fluorophore, and we are able to measure this by detecting uh, light emission at a longer wavelength. In case of nanobread, of course, this luciferase is um, the nanolac luciferase, which is, well, an exceptionally bright luciferase that was developed by Promega back in 2012. So that in the nanobread PPI technology, the principle is that you will fuse one of your interacting proteins to the nanolac luciferase, and the other interacting protein you label with uh, this acceptor fluorophore. And this is exactly where the halo tag comes into play because we don't do this labeling directly um, as you would do it, for example, when you use an autofluorescent protein as an acceptor molecule. There you would express a fusion of your protein and the autofluorescent protein. No, in uh, nanobread, we do it indirectly by using these fluorescent halo tag ligands. So we express a fusion of the protein of interest with halo tag, and we simply label it using the fluorescent halo tag ligand. And this indirect labeling has several advantages, but I will come to that in a minute. So once you've labeled these two proteins um, with nanolac and uh, the, the fluorescent acceptor, um, you can measure their uh, interaction if they interact donor and acceptor achieve this spatial proximity, oh, so we are able to measure the BRAT signal. If they dissociate again, we lose the BRAT signal. So what's the difference of nanobrad when compared to older BRAT systems such as BRAT1? Um, the difference is that these older BRAT systems are really limited in their sensitivity. These older BRAT systems, first of all, use um, luciferases that are um, that have a lower signal intensity, and they combine these with autofluorescent proteins. So in the BRAT1 system, you can actually see the problem which is caused by um, these uh, this fact. So in in fact, uh, in in BRAT1, we utilize the Renilla luciferase as a donor and YFP is used as an acceptor molecule. And you can see that these two signals are really, um, well, there's no big uh, spatial separation of these two signals. So they are very close, only 55 nanometers. In every BRAT experiment, we measure these two signals. So we measure the donor signal in the donor channel and the acceptor signal in the acceptor channel. And we then build a ratio, the so-called BRAT ratio, by normalizing the acceptor signal to the donor signal. So if these two signals are spectr not well spectrally uh, separated, if they are very narrow, then this leads to the 
issue that in fact a large portion of the signal that you detect in your acceptor channel is actually derived from the donor itself. And this very much decreases signal to background ratios. In Nanobrad, using this exceptionally bright luciferase, we were able to expand the spectral separation between donor and acceptor. So we combined the blue emitting nanolactociferase with a redshifted fluorophore. We expanded the separation by threefold if we compare it to BRAD1 uh, to 175 nanometers. So we thereby minimize the bleed through of this donor signal into the acceptor channel. And this, as you will see on the next slide, really improves the sensitivity of the assay. However, also in Nanobrad, we do have some sort of donor signal in the acceptor channel. So for every Brad experiment, you have to calculate that out by performing a so-called no acceptor control. This is a control where you leave away the acceptor and you can therefore easily determine the amount of donor signal in the acceptor channel. Once you've determined this um, bread ratio of the no acceptor control, you simply subtract that from the bread ratio of your sample, which is then your corrected bread ratio. And this is exactly the benefit of indirectly labeling the protein with the acceptor using halo tag because this allows you to perform only one transfection. So you transfect your cells with two plasmids, one encoding your nanolac fusion, the other encoding your halo tag fusion. And in order to perform the no acceptor control, you simply do not add the fluorescent halo tag ligand. In the older BRAD systems that use autofluorescent proteins, however, you have to do an extra transfection step in order to run that no acceptor control. So one plasmid encoding your, in case of BRAD1, Renilla luciferase fusion, one plasmid encoding your YFP fusion, and for the no acceptor control, you would transfect your Renilla fusion plasmid along with a plasmid that encodes the protein that you would normally fuse to YFP. However, the e acceptor sequence is missing in this case. So you have two transfections. And as we all know, every transfection is a major source of variability. So by this indirect labeling approach that we utilize in Nanoprat, we very much improve data quality by decreasing variability. This can be, um, the properties of nanobread can be nicely seen here. So this is a benchmark experiment where we um, tested the, or we measured the interaction of two well-known interacting proteins, FKBP and FRB, that's an inducible interaction. So the interaction is enforced by treatment with rapamycin. And we compared bread one with nanobread. As you can see on the top right panel, we get a massively improved signal to background ratio with nanobred as when compared to bread one. And this can be explained due to this spectral increased spectral separation of the two signals, donor and acceptor. And furthermore, uh, nanobred is also way more sensitive in this, uh, um, in this uh, diagram uh, down here we performed um, a serial dilution of the amount of DNA that was transfected into cells. And you can see that even at the highest dilution, we are able to detect a signal over background, which is the, the dotted, dotted line here with um, nanobrad, whereas we are not able to detect any signal that can be distinguished from assay background with, uh, with the BRAD1 system. What is the actual workflow of the Nanobrad PPI assay, it is, as you will, uh, will have noticed already, a simple transfection-based experiment. So you will clone your um, open reading frames of your two genes of interest into Nanolac and Halotag fusion vectors. These vectors are then going to be transfected. You allow for overnight expression of the Nanolac and the Halotag fusion proteins. The next day, the 
now perform a treatment of the cells to modulate the interaction, to induce it or to inhibit the interaction. And you then read out the donor and acceptor signal. You build your BRAT ratio, and this is the readout for the interaction of these two proteins. The most laborious step in establishing such a nanobrat PBI assay in your lab is the first step where you have to do some cloning because we highly recommend that you test for all different combinations. Meaning, you test your protein one, in this case FRB, with halo tag C terminally and then also N terminally together with your protein two, in this case FKBP, with nanolock C and N terminally, and then vice versa. So if you cannot exclude a single orientation, then in total this would mean that you have to test eight different combinations, so you will have to uh, generate these different expression plasmids. The reason why we highly recommend this is that the breath signal is highly sensitive towards changes in distance. Um, so it's not a linear correlation that we have here, but it's the signal or the efficiency of this breath transfer is inversely proportional to the sixth power of the distance. So even small changes in distance have a severe effect on the uh, um, on the transfer efficiency. And therefore, depending on the structure of your protein or the um, placement of the tags, this is something that is not predictable. So you really have to determine this empirically if you want to obtain an assay with uh, the optimal performance. This is just the data set for um, these eight different combinations of FRB and FKBP. And you can nicely see that there are severe differences in signal to background ratio. And you want to make sure not to work with the combination number four, but rather to work with the combination number five, which simply gives you the highest signal to background ratio. Once you've determined the optimal combination or the optimal tag placement, the second step that you need to do is you can now optimize your uh, di the dynamic range of the assay by minimizing the amount of unbound donor in your sample. So you will actually test different dilutions of the donor plasmid to find out which combination yields the, the best dynamic range. And then finally, you of course will have to verify that any signal that you may detect is specific for the interaction of these two proteins and not an unspecific signal. And for this, you have two options basically. Um, in an ideal case, you would have a two compound available meaning a compound of which you know that it modulates this interaction. Unfortunately, in most cases, this does not apply. Um, so if there is no two compound available, what you can do is a so-called donor saturation assay or DSA. In a DSA, what you do is that you start with your optimized donor acceptor ratio that you just determined and you now keep the donor concentration constant while you titrate the ex amount of acceptor. If your signal is specific, so is it a specific signal because of the interaction of these two proteins, you will observe a curve similar like this, so a hyper hyperbolic curve that somehow reaches a plateau because at that point all the um, donor molecules are saturated with acceptor. However, if you rather observe something like this, um, then you can conclude that it's a non-specific signal that you detected. So if it's rather a linear uh, increase that you see with a very modest um, slope, 
um, then this is caused by so-called bystander bread. So due to the random collision of uh, acceptor and donor molecules in your sample, and this does not indicate a specific signal due to a protein-protein interaction. The first interaction pair um, or nanobread PPI assay that Promega actually developed uh, was an assay to look at the interaction of um, a prote protein called BRD4 and various histone isoforms. BRD4 is a member of the bromon extra terminal domain or BAT family of uh, proteins. These are transcriptional co-activators and they, well, they regulate the um, expression of various oncogenes such as oncogenes of the MYC family, which are, um, and interestingly, many of these bad family proteins are found to be dysregulated in uh, cancers and other diseases. So there is kind of an interest in developing um, um, therapies that are able to correct this uh, dysregulation. And the mechanism of action of these therapeutics is now the displacement of the bad family protein from the chromatin, from the histone. Of course, as the, the bad proteins are no enzymes, they are, well, an assay that a well, measures the inhibition of enzymatic activity does not help in this case. So here for developing these kinds of therapeutics, there was really a need for an assay that is capable of detecting this displacement of the bat family protein from the chromatin. And this was a nice task for uh, nanobrad PPI. So what we did here is that we expressed the histone isoform as a fusion to halotac and uh, BRD4 or also other, other uh, bat family proteins as a fusion to nanolac luciferase. So in the situation where um, BRD4 is bound to the chromatin, we have a BRAD signal. However, we lose that signal in the moment that BRD4 is displaced from the chromatin. Now, as we already talked about, uh, Halotech is 34 kilodaltons in size. So we actually, by fusing Halotech to histones, we add a considerable molecular weight to these proteins. So the key question was whether this, let's say, recombinant chromatin or these recombinant histones, um, if they assemble or uh, integrate into the chromatin, and if this chromatin is actually still functional, we therefore performed a fluorescent imaging approach where we expressed all kinds of histone isoforms as a fusion to halotac, and we added the halotac TMR ligand and performed confocal imaging. And here are some of the images that we obtained for four different uh, histone isoforms, which um, nicely illustrates that yes, these recombinant histones do integrate in the, into the chromatin. And yes, this chromatin is still functional because we can nicely see these different uh, mitotic uh, stages in which these cells are. So now that we've performed this proof of principle experiment, we um, moved on to actually see whether we can measure the displacement of BRD4 from the chromatin by treatment with this compound called IBED151. And here you can see two data sets with uh, two distinct histone isoforms, 3.3 uh, and 4. And you can nicely see the IBED151 concentration dependent decrease in the bread ratio indicating the concentration dependent displacement of BRD4 from that particular isoform. These, those response curves also allow us for um, calculation of an IC50 value. Um, from this, you can also make a statement on the ability of the drug to displace BRD4 from various histone isoforms. Uh, in this case, we see a higher ability of IBED151 to um, disrupt the interaction with histone 4 as when compared to histone 
3.3. And I think with this, um, we Okay, um, so hopefully everyone is back and we can uh, continue. Um, we stopped by talking about uh, the use of nanobread for studying protein-protein interactions. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, this technology um, is actually more versatile, so it can be used for uh, also for studying the interaction of a protein with um, a ligand, and this ligand could be a peptide or it could be a small molecule. We call this approach nanobread uh, target engagement. And the idea is here that you will typically start um, with this question. So you have a target and you have a compound and you want to know if they interact in a live cell context. So what you do is that you express the target as a nanolock fusion. Um, this is what in the end will provide specificity of your signal. And then you need a so-called tracer molecule. A tracer is composed of a small molecule of which you know that it has affinity for your target of interest. And this small molecule is now fused to a fluorescent dye that functions as the acceptor in this nanobread experiment. So the tracer is in fact the component that allows for quantitation. If you add the tracer to your cells expressing the nanolock target fusion, and if that tracer binds the target, you can see this by an increase in the bread signal. And now this, um, let's say a bread producing complex, we now utilize in order to measure binding of compounds to our target, because if compounds have an affinity for the target, they will eventually displace the tracer from the target and therefore compound target interaction can be uh, detected by a decrease in the bread signal. This nanobread target engagement strategy um, was validated for various extracellular protein ligand interactions as uh, interactions with uh, GPCR receptors or receptor tyrosine kinases, um, but also for intracellular interactions where um, a ligand binds an intracellular protein such as a receptor, intracellular receptor, or an enzyme. And in fact, this, these intracellular assays we've meanwhile validated for different target classes, um, E3 ligases, different E3 ligases, um, um, members of the, the bat family of proteins that we also already talked about, um, various HDEX isoforms, and then probably the largest target class that we have ready to use assays for are currently the kinases. So we have more than 340 ready to use kinase target engagement assays. All these assays already contain um, the vector that encodes the target nanolock fusion and a validated tracer for that particular target as well as detection reagents. So you're basically uh, ready to, to go. The nanobred target engagement assays can be used in two assay modes. Um, assay mode number one is uh, depicted here. So when you get such uh, a nanobred TE kit in your lab and you would 
well, you, you get the kit with an optimized uh, a protocol that you can use as a guideline. However, if you would establish such an assay from scratch in your lab, what you would do first is that you would titrate uh, the tracer, which is shown down below. So you would transfect your cells with uh, the uh, nanolock um, target expression vector. Then you would titrate in the tracer and you would go for um, a concentration of the tracer between the IC50 or IC80 um, uh, value. This concentration you now use for your actual experiments. So you add that particular tracer concentration to the cells. And now after incubation, you will now add your test drug library and you measure the interaction of test drugs with your target by the displacement of the tracer and therefore um, a decrease in the breadth signal from these, those response curves, of course, you can now also determine IC50 values and so on. Another important component in the nanobread target engagement assay simply to uh, improve the assay performance is a so-called extracellular na nanolock inhibitor, which simply assures that all the donor signal that you detect in the assay is really from intracellular, um, because this is where you would like to measure the interaction of the drug with the target. So if there is a, well, target nanolock proteins floating around the cell culture supernatant because of cell death or whatsoever, you're not interested in um, an interaction with this extracellular protein, but only with the intercellular fraction, which is why we have this um, inhibitor included in the detection reagents. So now that you um, performed this, you, this assay allows you also to um, determine actually an apparent Ki value. For this, you would use your compound. In this case, it's a kinase inhibitor called the Zatinib. You run a titration of this compound at various tracer concentrations. And if you now plot the IC50 values that you determined here against the tracer concentration, you should be able to obtain such yeah, a linear curve. Uh, this is called the linearized cheng prasov analysis. And the intercept with the y-axis axis corresponds to your Ki apparent value. So the affinity of your um, compound in the absence of a tracer. This is an important value because it is also fundamental for the second assay mode that Nanobred can be used for. Um, the Nanobred target or the target engagement or the efficacy of a drug um, in vivo is actually not only governed by the affinity of that particular drug for the target, but in vivo where we have a non-steady state situation, it is rather important to have drugs that have a long drug residence time. So the time that the drug actually stays bound to the target of interest. And this is a parameter that can be determined using the nanobred target engagement assay as well. Actually, it's just the same assay the other way around. So in this case, you would express your target of interest as an analog fusion in cells. You would add your compound of interest that you would like to measure the drug residence time of at a concentration that corresponds to 10 to the 20 times of the Ki apparent that you determined. You incubate for around two hours to allow for reaching um, an equilibrium. And you now, in the next step, perform a washout. You then add the detection reagent containing the substrate for the nanolac luciferase, followed by the addition of a saturating dose of the tracer. And what you now measure is the regain in bread signal due to the displacement of the compound by the tracer. So you thereby determine the uh, time that your compound actually 
occupies uh, the target of interest, is bound to the target of interest. When running these experiments, there are different controls that are very important. Um, a zero target occupancy control, which is basically a, a control where you do not add the test compound, and therefore all of the targets will be bound by tracer. A full target occupancy control, which you can perform either by using a covalent inhibitor for the target if that's available, or you, you simply use a saturating dose of a compound. Importantly, you have to keep this, well, you have to keep the, the concentration of this compound constant also during the washout step, so you will include it in your wash solution as well. And then a third control that can be performed um, simply to rule out the possibility that your um, test compound might be intracellularly trapped. You can also run a permeable assay, uh, a control where you permeabilize cells, um, and this allows you to determine how this intracellular trapping might affect the kinetics of your drug residence time uh, profile. This is some, uh, some um, data how it could look like now. So you have your time-dependent profile where you um, uh, measure or determine the bread ratio. For example, if you have such a hyperbolic shape, this where you see a rapid increase in the bread signal, you have a short residence time because the drug is immediately replaced by the tracer. Um, this would correspond to a long residence time, or if you have a very modest slope, um, that's a very long residence time or even um, indicates a covalent inhibition. In real data, it pretty much looks the same. That's an example with the Bruton's tyrosine kinase and three different drugs that were used to measure drug resonance time. And you can see that we um, can obtain these uh, different profiles. So in purple, a drug with a short residence time. In green, a drug with a long residence time. And in fact, this uh, red drug number three is a covalent inhibitor. So here we have no regain in breath signal because of that covalent interaction. So why is that important? Um, I mentioned not only affinity counts, but also drug residence time, um, because uh, this is, yeah, I think that's furthermore illustrated by this example that I would like to show here. So that's in fact um, an example where we measured uh, drug residence time and target engagement at HDAG1. So we used an HDAC1 nanolock fusion and we tested two different compounds, Wokotinostat and Zaha. As you can see, um, when looking at the affinity, it appears that Zaha has a lower IC50 value, so a higher affinity for HDAC1 when compared to Wokotinostat. However, if we now look at the drug residence time, you can nicely see that the affinity does not predict the drug residence time in vivo. Um, the drug residence time, which we measured here, nicely illustrates that, in fact, Saha, which had well the higher affinity, in fact, shows a sh very much shorter drug residence time as one compared to Mokatinostat. So this illustrates how this kinetic selectivity of drugs is really important when um, performing these analyses. So not only look at, um, well, drug affinity, but also look at a uh, drug residence time. And this brings me to the last topic of today's talk, where I would like to touch on the use of the HaloTag technology for targeted protein degradation. I mentioned that we've developed a halo tag ligand um, called halo protag 3 and this halo tag ligand is composed well of the chloroalkane linker sequence as all halo tag ligands and attached to this a uh, small molecule 
that binds the von Hippel-Lindau E3 ligase. So the idea of this assay is that it allows you to perform phenotypic screenings, phenotypic uh, drug screenings, um, because it is, well, it is quite an effort to develop a protax. So a first question you might have is whether knockdown of a given protein is actually leading to the desired phenotype. Um, for example, if you have a cancer cell and you knock down one of the proteins, then you have a slower growth of these cells. That might be a phenotype that you would like to um, obtain. And in order to, to verify this upfront before taking the effort to develop a protact, this assay can be very helpful. Um, but it might be also helpful as a tool to simply knock down proteins for a longer period of time. If you use as iRNA, as hRNA, um, that's um, a knockdown approach that allows you to knock down proteins all, only for a rather limited time frame. You have a much longer knockdown if you really degrade the cellular um, a protein pool. So the way this assay works is that you insert two sequences to your target gene of interest using CRISPR-Cas9. One sequence is the sequence of the halotag protein, and the other sequence is the sequence of a bioluminescent peptide tag called Hybit. Hybit is a split subunit of the nanolac luciferase, and it is optimized to have an exceptionally high affinity for its complementary counterpart subunit. So if both subunits are present in solution, they will immediately complement and reconstitute a functional luciferase. So what we do here is that we now endogenously tag our protein of interest with Halotag and Hybit, and we can now add this Halo Protag 3, this novel um, Halo Tag ligand that we designed. And this Halo, tag, Halo Protag 3 will now irreversibly bind to Halotag, and the other part of that ligand will recruit the von Hippel E3 Lindau uh, ligase. Um, so that your target protein will be polyubiquitinylated, target to, targeted to uh, proteasomal degradation. And we now utilize this hybrid peptide tag for detection of this degradation process. So the hylotag moiety is used for targeting this protein for degradation, and we measure degradation using hybrid. How can we do this? We can do this by co-expressing the complementary subunit in cells or simply by addition of a lytic reagent um, in which this complementary subunit that is called large bit in which this subunit is present and we thereby quantify the amount of remaining target protein within the sample. A proof of concept study that we performed is about uh, the wind pathway is focusing on beta catenin, which is a key component of that pathway. Um, this pathway is kind of illustrated here. So beta catenin under non-stimulated conditions is subjected to proteasomal degradation. However, when the pathway is activated by binding of the wind ligand to the frizzled receptor, this degradation process is stopped. Beta catenin will accumulate in the cytosol and subsequently translocate to the nucleus. There it will dimerize with TCF LEF transcription factors. And this dimer can now bind to TCF uh, response elements to trigger the expression of responsive target genes. So, what we wanted to know is. Um, when we tag beta catenin endogenously with halotag and hybrid, whether we can measure degradation of that protein using the halo protex 3 ligand. And in fact, this is the case, as you can see here, various doses of um, the, um, the halo protag 3 that was added at time point zero 
leads to a time-dependent uh, decrease in the luminescent signal, so degradation of this fusion protein. And in the second experiment, we wanted to know whether this degradation now results in a change of the phenotype. So whether this degradation can block the transcriptional activity at um, these responsive genes, the, the TCF response elements. So what we did here is to run a conventional gene reporter experiment. We used um, a Firefly-based um, response element vector in which these TCF response elements were cloned up front of a minimal promoter followed by the Firefly luciferase gene. And then we treated these cells that were transfected with this vector with the wind ligand, different concentrations. And you can see that with increasing concentrations of this wind ligand, so stimulation of the pathway, we see an increase in transcriptional response. However, if we co-treat with the Halo Protect 3 at one micromolar, we see that we can um, massively diminish this transcriptional activity. And with this, I would like to um, close. I'm at the end of this presentation. Um, I'm happy to take your questions if you have any. Um, otherwise, I also included uh, my email address on this last slide. So if you have any questions later on, feel free to contact me or our colleagues from Eastport. Um, and I think we will also make the, the presentation slides available afterwards. Um, yeah, so thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take your questions. Okay, thank you, Eric, for a very nice presentation. So if any of you have any questions, so feel free to ask. You can raise the hand or unmute yourself or type it in the chat. In case the chat doesn't work, uh, you can send an email to either me or Eric directly and we will <clears throat> answer questions afterwards. Okay, so it seems there are no questions. <clears throat> yeah, we have we have one. Okay. Uh, was the halo tech used in plant cells or any plant samples? Um, well, for sure, Promega at Promega, we haven't uh, done this. I'm personally, I'm not aware of any publications where halo tech has been applied in plants. Um, presumably, um, there's a good chance that it can be applied for uh, plant model systems. Um, of course, the expression plasmids that we provide, they are all intended for mammalian cells. So you would have to, well, reclone uh, the, the halotech sequence into a plant compatible vector, meaning uh, with regard to uh, the, the promoter. And um, maybe you will also have to um, codon optimize the halotech uh, gene itself uh, to improve expression in plant cells. Um, the, the, the question is um, what application you intend to use Halotech for in plant cells. If it's well fluorescent imaging, then the question of course is um, the permeability of these fluorescent ligands, whether they make it into the cell through the cellular wall. Um, I don't think that I've seen any uh, data on this yet, but it well might be interesting to to explore this. Okay, we have another question. Uh, was nanobread technology ever used for RNA protein interactions? Are you aware of any of any works or publications? No, uh, not that I know. Um, there is an approach where um, people were trying to look at DNA protein interaction using nanobread. In, um, in this case, well, in this case, um, well, actually it's, yeah, 
In this, in this case, one would use um, the Cas9 endonuclease in a mutated variant, so a dead Cas9. And, and people were trying to target this dead Cas9 to the promoter site of interest with a particular CRISPR RNA. Um, and this Cas9 was also fused to Nanolock, I think. And then the transcription factor of interest was fused to the halotag protein. So when this transcription factor binds to the particular promoter site, um, a, a bread signal was obtained. Um, so I heard that this was a strategy that people were working on. I'm not aware of any well public publication of this uh, on this or whether this was actually successful, um, but it was well an an interesting um, approach, but I'm not aware of any um, any studies on uh, protein RNA interaction using nanobread. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, okay, so we have another from Dr. Lenchek, does nanobread require a luminometer capable of simultaneous measurement of donor and acceptor? Would you expect significant error if I measure it sequentially? So if you measure fluorescence itself and the luminescence itself, and then you calculate it manually. Um, well, the thing is, first of all, yes, um, we do recommend uh, to have um, a lumin lumin luminometer capable of filtering out these two signals. Um, many of the available luminometers on the market are capable of measuring bread or they have the appropriate filters to measure nanobread. Doing it uh, sequentially, well, actually what, what these plate readers do, they also measure it sequentially. So they but on a well per well basis. So I would assume if you have a, um, a plate reader that, and you measure luminescence first and then fluorescence on a well per well basis, this might be possible. However, the idea of filtering out these two signals is actually to suppress background so that you don't detect the luminescence signal in um, your, um, Okay, so it seems that there are no further questions. So once again, if you come up with any questions after the webinar, you can write an email either to me or to Eric directly, and we will try to answer your questions as, as fast as possible. And thank you for attending the webinar. We are happy that you've attended in such big numbers. <laughs> I know that everyone is probably overfed with webinars during the COVID pandemic, but that's one of the ways we can show you some great new approaches. So thank you again, Eric. Thank you all for attending and see you at our next webinar. Thanks a lot.